My name's Professor Hugh Possingham and I'm a professor at the University of Queensland in Ecology and Mathematics. Protected areas are one way of conserving marine systems. They are used to protect those ecosystems from threatening human activities such as line fishing, trawling and infrastructure construction. Most countries have signed international conventions agreeing to conserve at least 10% of their ocean in marine protected areas. The fraction of the world that is in a protected area has grown almost exponentially over the last 50 years. Terrestrial protected areas grew rapidly at first and marine protected areas have started to catch up in the last decade. While these official statistics make protected areas appear to be a modern phenomenon, we must remember that traditional cultures have had protected areas for centuries. In marine systems, for example, some Polynesian cultures voluntarily chose to conserve particular reefs, fishing them only occasionally for ceremonial purposes. While these graphs may enthuse the average environmentalists, simply grabbing parts of the ocean and making them a marine protected area is not what systematic conservation planning is all about. Like every other human endeavour, the best outcomes come from having clear objectives, good plans, and smart science-based principles, and this is what we're going to discuss. The early principles for systematic conservation planning were fairly simple and also not very useful. Principle one is that, all else being equal, big reserves are better than small reserves, which is fairly obvious. Principle two is that, all else being equal again, having more reserves is better than having few reserves, again an unremarkable insight. Principle three is that, all else being equal, reserves that have a large edge to area ratio are less effective, and this is generally true. Principle four is that, all else being equal, connected reserve systems are better than disconnected reserve systems, although we must remember that some connections, such as connections that facilitate the spread of a disease, may not be good. And principle five is that it's better to have reserves that are closer together than further apart. This means that if a species becomes locally extinct in one reserve, then colonisation from a nearby reserve is more likely. The principle makes sense, but geographic proximity is not necessarily the key to recolonisation, as we shall see later, particularly in marine systems. Further, reserves that are close together are likely to be struck by the same catastrophe, like a hurricane. So, spreading our risk geographically can be more important than promoting connectivity. This last principle is somewhat disputed. Notably, these traditional principles all relied on that caveat, all else being equal, which implies all areas are roughly the same habitat and the cost of conservation in every place is the same. But this is never true in reality. Let's look at the modern principles of conservation planning. Conservation science now relies on four more fundamental reserve design principles. We call these the care principles. The first principle, the C, a connected reserve system is one where recolonisation of locally extinct populations is likely regardless of their geographic location. For marine systems this means conserving marine habitats that are connected by currents, facilitating colonisation via larvae or other propagules. Furthermore, connectivity between habitat types, different habitat types, is also very important for species that need to complete their life cycle in more than one habitat, for example mangroves and seagrass. An adequate reserve system, the A, is one that is big enough and of sufficient quality to ensure the long-term persistence of all species in the reserve system. Adequacy is one of the hardest principles to quantify for a reserve system often requiring detailed population models for every species, which is also often not practical. Representation, the R, is probably the most important principle of protected area system design. A representative marine protected area system is one that includes examples of all kinds of biodiversity features, all the species and all the habitats. For example, in a marine system, not only would we like to conserve samples of every kind of marine habitat, say mangroves, seagrass, mudflats and reefs, we'd also like to protect diversity within those habitat types, all the different kinds of mangrove forest. This requires very good spatial data. Finally, we must recognise that people utilise marine ecosystems for other purposes other than conservation, and if we restrict access to the, their access to places 
that are commercially or recreationally valuable, then proposals for systems of marine protected areas are likely to fail politically. This is the efficiency bit. We need to be efficient. A small, a smart protected area system designer finds out where different users extract resources or happiness from using marine systems and then tries to avoid restricting that use as much as possible. Maps of the commercial value of fisheries or the frequency of use by recreational fishers can be used to help us achieve conservation outcomes while annoying as few people as possible, being as sufficient as possible. Protected area system design is not just science, it's also social science and economics because of this th th fourth and final principle. To illustrate these fundamental principles of marine, marine protected area design, let's have a look at a simple example. Imagine eight sites, eight places that could each be a reserve, and each of those eight places contains some of ten different conservation features. These are the features on the left. Site A is the richest site. It has eight of those features. Some features, like the seagrass, are in many of the sites. Other features, like the grey nurse shark, are rare are in, are, and are in only one site. So which of these eight sites should we conserve? If our task is to conserve every feature at least once, and we don't care about efficiency, and we don't care about impacts on other uses, we would take all the sites. This is clearly politically unrealistic. So how could we conserve at least one representation of every one of these features for the least total cost? And we'll assume that all sites cost the same amount. Have a think. Site A looks like a good choice, but it misses two of the features, so we need at least two more sites, maybe sites B and C, and then we would get one representation of every one of the features. Intriguingly, the solution that achieves all our objectives most efficiently is to conserve sites C and E. Greedy is not always good. Grabbing the site with the most species is not always best. Sites C and E complement each other perfectly, even though they are not the most diverse sites on their own. So you can see designing a system of marine protected areas is not as simple as, a school, as it looks. Greedy is not always the best way to design marine reserve systems. There are some conservation groups who do not like efficiency in conservation planning. They believe that we should take as much as we can get, ignoring issues of efficiency, connectivity and representation. They just want to see that graph of the world's protected areas grow as fast as possible, regardless of the quality of what is protected. What do you think of that sort of approach to conservation? The four fundamental principles of conservation planning are illustrated in our animation. Have a look at that now.